came here. It was, it was magic. The set made it vast. <laughs> and then uh, uh, right now, uh, we have a photo show up, and we, we do regular events. And tonight I'm so very, very pleased to welcome John Lobel. I'm a big fan of your work, and most recently of your father's. Thank you. So, thank you so much for coming, and welcome to 292 East 3rd Street. Thank you. Well, Rami, thank you for having me. And just so you know how this particular event came about, Rami's my proofreader. So uh, in our new world of self-publishing, uh, one does have to get a proofread. So she's uh, been regularly working with us. So I'm going to talk about my father. And everybody's dad is the greatest dad, right? Except I'm not even supposed to call him dad. He hated dad. It's Nat. His name was Nathan, so I call him that. And just a little anecdote, I was born in 41, so 49 I would have been eight. And for two years before 49, my parents were, were writing a novel. And so, you know, galleys and all this stuff was going on. And uh, very confusing to me, because I'd see books in the store, and I knew the stuff in the store was manufactured. So I assumed books were manufactured. <laughs> you know, people wrote books. <laughs> you know, there was a home cottage industry. So my mother's father was a mystery writer. He and Dashiell Hammett each would use a half a dozen pseudonyms and fill up Black Cat and Black Mask Mystery Magazine every month. And uh, my grandmother, uh, his wife, kept all of his stories. He had the cover of the story and a pin going to a sewing pin going through his before paper clips. And so I once contacted the woman who owned a, a bookstore in New York, Murder, Inc., and asked her about it. She says, you know, if your grandmother had kept the whole magazines, you and I could retire. <laughs> but anyway, the book they wrote was The Shadow and the Blot. And I'll mention it, but if anybody's interested, these, these things can be found on Amazon and Abe Books, A-B-E Books. People are selling them used, you know, all the time. So I have three or four copies. And in 1977, my father, um, well, let's just do a quick, it's going to be in the reading, but um, my father's parents came from Central Europe. He was born here. His older siblings were born in the old country. Uh, he went to City College in Columbia Law, where he met my mother. They were in the New Deal, so they were in Washington. 1951, they uh, moved to Great Neck. And then after I went to um, college, they moved into Manhattan and then to Wilton, Connecticut. So that's where they both died. In 1977, my father had just decided to sit down and, and write a memoir uh, about his growing up in the South Bronx between 1916 and 1926. So when he was 5 to 15 in age. And my father's a brilliant writer, brilliant with language, and so he didn't, he didn't, you know, he didn't rewrite or revise, just sat down and wrote it. My mother typed it. And I, I'd done a couple books, and I, my agent looked at it and said it couldn't be published because he wasn't famous. It's just a story of a kid growing up. He even got a BB gun, which is, you know, right out of Gene Shepard's Christmas story. <laughs> uh, but. A couple of a year or so ago, I said, you know what, self-publishing is so easy now. You just email the stuff to Amazon's Create Space, and there's the book. And did little steps in between. I had a proofreader and a designer, but that was it. And the um, and fascinating thing about it, this one doesn't say it, it'll say, this book manufactured, you know, uh, uh, January 2nd, 2015. In other words, it's printed on demand. It, it's basically Xeroxed, you know. I mean, it's a totally quality printing, 
but they don't make a bunch of them and sit in a warehouse. I mean, just these totally new technology. I give a warehouse. What's that? Why would you do that? You know, you want the book, they print it and ship it, and you have it the next day. So, uh, with that, let me. I'm much better at free associating than I am at reading. I'm not a good reader. All my, I, I teach and my, I never read my lectures. You know, I just, uh, the slides prompt me, but, so I'll see how well I do at reading. And I'm gonna skip the Yiddish because I have absolutely no facility in Yiddish. There's a whole chapter on the Yiddish, which I'll just describe. I also I'm no good at German, so. Uh, so this is my preface. One fall afternoon late in my father's life, I was walking with him along a lane cut through the woods in Connecticut. He started speaking in German, uh, the translation being, when Zarathustra was 30 years old, he left his home. The opening lines of Nietzsche's Zarathustra, he then remarked, I haven't read that since I was 17. So this is the kind of mind he had, you know. Um, Nat, as he insisted on being called in our home, he disliked dad, etc. loved art, music, and making things, and he was very talented at all that he did. He also loved literature and language. My name is John Joyce Lobel, because he was making his way through Finnegan's Wake for the second time when I was born. When my high school and college friends were discovering French existentialists and advocates of a nouveau roman, the new novel, as rebellions against the parents, I was discovering them on my father's night table. You know, he'd be kept getting lost in the middle of a book, he'd be reading it, and I'd wandered off with it. You know, here's um, Alain Resnay's uh, um, uh, The Erasers or something like that. Um, he didn't reread Nietzsche, he didn't have to. He retained what he read so that when I was reading Gide, I could discuss books with him that he had read many years earlier. But about every five years, he would dig out his old, battered, modern library, Jane Austen, and reread her novels. He insisted that my sister read the classics and discuss them with him, an exercise that serves her to this day in her writing. My sister's right there. Can I just add an anecdote? Yeah. Is that I belong to a street boy, and I had a lot of friends, and I had them read the chapters and tell me what happened. She farmed it out. <laughs> didn't know that. And it was not just art, music, and literature that interested my father subscribed to Scientific American, and to this day I recall articles I read and discussions we had in the 50s about computers, self-replicating machines. Uh, my friends, my friends like to hang out at our house. Um, so, this goes on through uh, a bit more, but it's one anecdote in my introduction, I'll tell you. And the rest is just sort of to fill in his biography, because he you only know, is covering this 10-year period. That was one of the most educated people I have ever known, but he also retained his Bronx background. In one instance, he was at the Securities and Exchange Commission. He was the executive director. He ran the SEC. He had a week of meetings with a Boston law lawyer named Lewis over regulatory problems of a company Lewis was representing. When things got testy, Lewis would turn on more and more of a haughty Boston accent than manner. In response, my father would become more and more Bronx in accent than manner. By the end of the week, they had settled things, and Lewis asked my father out to lunch. My father thought for a moment and then decided that since everything was settled, it would be ethically all right to accept the offer. Apparently, some government officials in those days were more ethically careful than many are today. <laughs> At lunch, Lewis asked my father if his family was from Chernovich. He, my father said it was, and Lewis asked them what their name had been before coming through Ellis Island. My father said Lubel, L-O with an umlaut, B-L. And Lewis replied, I thought so, we're cousins, if distant. <laughs> My branch of the family arrived in Boston rather than New York, and it quickly became apparent it was not going to work to be Jewish in Boston, so we adopted the name Lewis. The story is interesting in several ways. The one I like is that my father could revert to his Bronxness, Bronxness if he wanted to.
So let me jump ahead. This is my father's note, like for the back of the book, or, you know, author's note. Let me just figure out a time, just so I can pace myself here. So at the time he wrote this, Irving Howe's World of Our Fathers was kind of being read. So he begins, Irving Howe's World of Our Fathers grants only a few spare lines to the Bronx. The rich and colorful lives of the Jews in the Southeast Bronx, mm -hmm. where I grew up, deserves a fuller description. In these pages, I have tried to give a capsule account of when I was a boy there 50 to 60 years ago from 1977. Among other things you will discover, how to score a point at stoop ball, how to cheat the gas company, and how to tamper with a butcher's scale. His father could throw a lead cushion sinker into a chicken and get it out before wrapping it. You, know. <laughs> uh, you will learn how kosher meat is slaughtered, how gas is made from coal. Imagine in New York, you could walk to places where they had these giant ovens with you know these, with this glow coming out of the coal being heated to drive off the gas, and ran the gas stoves and the street lights. You learn um, and how to prepare dafshots, starting with a trip to Bronx Park to gather wood. These are aromatic woods for the smoking of the meat, and ending up with a gourmet dish on a carved-out oak plank. You will find out how the buying of soup greens could be a searing experience for a little kid. <laughs> Go back and get a tomato. He didn't give you a tomato. <laughs> the violence is here between father and son, husband and wife. The ambitions for the children are described. For the son to be a doctor and for the daughter to marry one. <laughs> The Woikas, or Verkers, depending on what part of Central Europe you are from, are overheard in the passionate arguments about the unions and their politics, the shopkeepers, their women, the peddlers, the backyard musicians. The whole cast of characters that made up the pageant of the street is paraded in these pages. In the streets, on the roofs, in the flats, people are everywhere. The kids and their parents struggling to find a way up and out. So that's what I put on the back of the book. So he opens Fox Street in my day. Often in my grown up life, I have dreamed of going back to Fox Street in the Southeast Bronx, the street of tenements where I lived as a child. In my dreams, Fox Street is an elegant Venetian canal line with stately granite palazzos, or a city on a hill with a golden sunlight dappling its white marble structures. Sometimes I dream, I dig into our letterbox at 744 Fox Street and pull out an accumulation of mail, sneakers, and junk that have been stored there during the years after I left. In this book, I have gone back to Fox Street and its people in my day, living in it from the years 1916 to 1926. It is, in the shimmering space of these memories, neither the place of my dreams nor what it is now, in fact, in 1977, it was already um, rubble. Um, what it is now, in fact, in the 1970s, a facade of abandoned, burned out, crumbling tenements, an old victim, like so many ones, like so many live ones, of the mindless destructiveness of the last ethnic wave to wash over the place. I'll be talking mostly about Jews, but these were double shifted Jews. They or their parents had the energy not only to escape to America from the ghettos, the hunger, the pogroms, or conscription into the armies of the czars and emperors but also to migrate from the miseries of the east side of Manhattan, where we are now, <laughs> into the country, <laughs> to the Bronx, the borough of the still empty lots and clean air. They were the first wavelet of Jews who, or their children, later moved further north into the Westchester suburbs or even exurban Connecticut to Hollywood and to Miami, and like us, to Great Neck. <laughs> to them, the Yiddish, Yiddishiket 
the state of being Jewish, was all right in its place, but they were in vision and in aspiration Americans. They had already, you know, settled into this idea. Far from the rabbi-ridden, tight little ghettos of Central Europe. To them, it was a mark of great passage to become a hot citizen, a citizen, and Shirsh Eugenha, to yellow out a greener or a greenhorn, to integrate. Thus, compact and relatively cohesive as the Fox Street ghetto was, it was in and part of America, porous at its borders, infusing and being infused by the larger world around it. I dedicate this book to the people who made and shared my experience in the little, but big enough for me, world of Fox and 156th Street, to the older ones long since gone, people who would have died by 1977, and to the contemporaries, even the Irish kids of the Springhurst gang, wherever they may be. So his next chapter is called Our Yiddish, and he just talks about how he writes phonetically, he disagrees with other writers, interpretations of Yiddish. He insists on a, a hard um, CH, um, as in Hader for the Hebrew school, etc. And since I don't have any facility in Yiddish, I'll skip that. And his next chapter is The Place. If you ride into the Bronx, north on the Buckner Boulevard overpass, after leaving the Triborough Bridge complex of roads, you will be passing through numbered streets. Look left at 156th Street. Beginning several blocks off are the remains of a block-long line of red brick tenement houses stretching from Southern Boulevard to Fox Street. These tenements and the very few that would be within a small circle around the juncture of Fox and 156th Street were the center of my world. When my family first moved to 744 Fox, much of the surrounding area was empty land, the lots. It had obviously once been farmland. There were no trees, but there was grass and there were scrubby weeds and shrubs struggling through the hard ground. The land adjoining 744 Fox had a considerable hill in the center formed by massive rock with creviced outcroppings and dirt paths up and down its sides. One, you could reach the, one could reach the East River in a 30 to 40 minute walk by going east, crossing a bridge over the New Haven Railroad tracks and making a way through a wide, sparsely settled area we called Springhurst. My mother's theory was my father was immune to polio due to swimming in the East River as a kid. <laughs> On one side was the enormous old factory of the American Banknote Company, dense blocks of apartment houses, and even an old convent of tan brick with a red tile roof and a high walled garden of which we could see only the tips of trees over which we could see only the tips of trees. <clears throat> On the other side were factories, the piano factory, whose litter included interesting scraps of shaped wood and piano parts, pin and envelope factories, steel fabricating plants, a generating station of the New Haven line, and so on. But the stretch we crossed on a direct route to the East River still contained small vegetable farms owned by Italians whose goats were tethered near the houses, deserted barns, dark and smelling, where the sun threw thin darts of light across the debris and flies buzzed lazily, and here and there an isolated tenement or a group of tenements standing alone in empty, weed-filled wastes. From them came the Springhurst gang, the wild and murderous mob of Irish kids who had sometimes crossed the track and terrorized the 150th Street, 156th Street and Fox Streets. Within a short time we moved to Fox Street, in a short time after we moved to Fox Street, the building began. The lots were soon heaped with tenements, drab, tan colored brick buildings crushing each other and crowding the sidewalks. It was fun while the buildings were going up. Bonfires and Mickey roasts aplenty in the still vacant land, 
and all the waste wood one could want if you wanted to build anything. There was just plenty of wood there. Enough usable lumber for a clubhouse, rickety and off-center, a patchwork of <laughs> ill-assorted slats, but precious to us and furnished with old pieces bagged or filched from our apartments. Enough to build an amphitheater in which Rosie Promway could produce her memorable show. <laughs> Um, talking about his uh, tenement, each floor of 744, except the ground floor, which contained only the janitor's apartment <coughs> and the stores, had five flats. One of them was an all-back apartment, the one we occupied, with windows facing only the yards. I don't think there was a single built flat in the building with more than two bedrooms, but many were occupied by families with as many as six kids and some, like the Cromwegs, housed this number of kids plus the husband of an older daughter. A bed of your own was a luxury. Until my brothers left home, one to go to college, the other to get married, I used to sleep with and between them in the south-facing bedroom. That bed lasted a long time, but it began to go when the room reverted to me. The first symptom was the rocking of the springs. Unless I kept myself in the mathematical center of the bed, the springs tipped. Whenever I changed position, it changed its slant with a bang. Several times I heard my father nail or screw the cleats which supported the springs to the wooden railing of the bed, but the springs always rocked, and from time to time it would droop. One of my early lovemaking sessions took place in that bed. To my timidity and anxiety was added my worry that the springs might not take the combined weights and bounces. It didn't. No sooner had we undressed and started our embrace, when the springs collapsed, the session ended in ignominy for me. <laughs> After my brothers left, my sister moved in with her husband and their baby during a lean period of her husband's career. He was a traveling salesman for a pearl button factory. They took my bedroom and I slept either on a flattened Morris chair or on a cot in the combination living room and dining room, really the headish disarray room, the landing place or everything for which no other place could be found. Sort of like our whole apartment. <laughs> He uh, then goes on to describe the street games. So he's just, you know, he's just unfoldingly describing the life of the community, the street, the area, and then autobiographically about himself, which then provides portraits, you know, of his violin teachers and etc. The street games. One of the most Delicious of my childhood sensations was to throw off my school clothes on the last day of school before vacation, put on a pair of fresh, stiff, new blue overalls on my bare body. Shoes were chucked into a closet. Sneakers went on. The end of a loaf of rye bread or cornbread was buttered, sometimes wrapped around a scallion, and I went downstairs, stood on the stoop for a moment, and drank in the delicious panorama of freedom. Almost immediately, games were organized. The ones I described, this is before television, right? <laughs> so, this is before, before iPads. <laughs> the ones I described were perennial and indigenous to the street, and they persisted through the times. So, I'll just read one or two of these. One a cat. Take a broomstick handle, cut off a bat about three feet long. Then cut from the balance of the stick a cat about three inches long. The bat is just the stick as it is. The cat is sharpened to one end like a dull pencil. Cat is placed on the ground, the asphalt pavement. It's point toward the field, the opposing players. About 20 feet down the curve on the right side, uh, a square is marked <coughs> off as a base. If there were enough kids to form teams, the game was played by one person against all uh, the others from two to five. 
The kids at bat would strike the cat at the pointed tip, trying to make it fly up and, and to be hit forward. So you bounce it in the air and then you swatted it with the, with the stick. If he fails in three tries, he's out. If he sends the cat, cat out, he tries to run uh, to base and home before he's tagged. Often the game would be played without foul lines. In that case, a cat that was knocked into a cellar stair opening or an empty garbage pail was a sure homer. <laughs> <laughs> the sequence of bat was determined by the order in which, without any predetermination sign, kids would yell, first up, second, etc. He describes curb marbles, real estate, which is um, marking off, oh, this is a game played, it's like mumbly picks with a pen knife, stoop ball, which you throw the ball against the curb. And then there would be fads of games that, you know, suddenly everybody was playing a certain game. This next chapter is on the street visitors. So these are the people. You know, I remember when I visited my grandmother, I was very young, some of the vendors, vegetables or knife sharpeners, had horse-drawn carts when I was a kid. So um, they just started to disappear, you know, I guess around 1950, something like that. But in his day, they would all be horses. The essential and colorful part of life on Fox Street was provided by the commerce that came there, on foot or on horse and wagon mostly, only rarely by truck. The Iceman. He clip-clopped his horse to the front of the building and with his tongs reached in and pulled. Of course, no one had a refrigerator. He had an ice box, so he had to have a fresh block of ice going there every few days. Um, he pulled a block of ice toward the back of the wagon. He scored the block with the point of the tongs and with a pick made several stabs along the scored groove separating off a piece neatly. With his tongs, he flung the ice on his shoulder, which was, carried, co which was covered with a rubber mat. He trudged up the stoop into the building, leaving a fine trail of droplets behind them. He knew the size of every ice block for every customer, ranging from a 15 to a 35 cent piece. He would open the top door of the double-tiered ice box, shove the remnant of the last piece aside, and fling in the fresh block. You paid him then and there. Water from melted ice collected in a flat metal pan under the box. If you forgot to pull out the empty pan, my chore, pull out and empty the pan, my chore, you'd soon see a puddle on the floor around the box. There were several reasons for interest in the Iceman. His wagon was dark and cool. It had an unforgettable smell of wet wood and burlap. Besides, it was a source of a goodie. With the Iceman, while the Iceman was in the building, delivery, we would climb into the back and pick up pieces of ice and scrape and scraps to suck and chew. It was a brave thing to do. One, you might get caught by the Iceman. This curses in loud and slurvy in Italian were awesome. Two, your mother might catch you and slap the ice away. Three, you ran the risk of serious disease. Yeah. We kids had a theory that since ice was made with ammonia, uh. sucking it might give you pneumonia. It was plausible to us, but we dared. So he goes on to describe the coal man, the milk man, street cleaner, the ices man. So he would, of course, be Italian. The ices man had a small flat push cart bearing a burlap cover, covered block of ice. Running the length of the cart was a tray of bottles with colored and flavored liquids. You still see that around today, right? Like around Washington Square. Um, these had pointed nozzles. For a small amount, two cents, three cents, he would scrape the block of ice with a cup-like scraper having a tooth bottom. The scrapings would rise in the cup and, and, he, and be dumped into a cone-shaped paper holder. 
he called out your color or you called out your color or flavor and he would shake some of the liquid out of the bottle on the scrapings. Even though he invariably chose a shady spot in which to park and you tended to eat your ices near his cart, it was not long before the cold shavings merged with the liquid color went, and went down as a drink. Such is the power of legitimacy that we never pause to wonder why the ice from the ice man's wagon might give you pneumonia, but the ice from the ice man wagon would not. So the merry-go-round comes, his backyard musicians, I'm forever blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles in the air. And then there was a guy who came around, some form of instant photography. Uh, way back in those, the pony picture. Somewhere between the service people, the umbrella repairman, the knife grinder, the pot mender, and the amusements was the man with the camera and the pony. You ran upstairs, begged a quarter from your mother, and fidgeted until your turn came to sit on the pony and be photographed. You sat still, smiled at the command, and watched bewitched as the man's head disappeared under the black cloth hanging at the back of his camera, and he fiddled with the cap over the lens. Then he appeared again. You got down from the pony, and while you watched, pulled the slide from somewhere in the camera, yanked out the oblong piece of tin, dipped it in a cup of liquid suspended under the camera, fished it out, slapped into a cardboard frame, and handed you yourself gawking in the lens, head down. <laughs> Upstairs you ran, unable to take your eyes from it. When the man was through, he snapped together the legs of his wooden tripod, hoisted on his shoulder, and led his pony down away where he would set himself up again. Then there's the eye cash man, who um, comes and gives you cash for old clothes. Turkish candy, and then the real food. Nehet, knishes, sweet potatoes, and horseradish. I have not, since those days, seen another variety of sedentary vendor I watched with as great an interest as I watched the horseradish grinder. <laughs> this was invariably an old man, or a, this is before they had preservatives, right? so you can buy horseradish in a jar now. Um, this was invariably an old man or lady sitting at the curb on a busy shopping day. Set on a wheeled box was a little grinding machine. The machine had a perforated chum with sharp projections at each perforation and was turned by a crank. The horseradish, a long white root, was pushed against the turning wheel and the shredded grindings, <clears throat> wet and fragrant with the characteristic sharp smell of horseradish, would collect and be poured into a small bottle. Few Jews would eat their boiled meat, they rarely prepared it any other way, without a generous scoop of horseradish on the dish. Horseradish, or haran, came in two ways, plain white and purplish red. The red was simply made by adding beet juice. Horseradish spoiled very quickly, becoming discolored and tasting merely sour and rotten. So you bought small amounts, and when you bought from the little grinder, you were sure you were getting it fresh. Chewing tar, fruit. And now I'll, I'll read about um, my father got interested in art. So there are these kids, you know, who might be into this or might be into that, somewhat older, who were the teachers of the younger kids. So one of his friends was Frankie, who was uh, four years older and an aspiring artist. And when we were not otherwise engaged, we kids clustered around him, listening when he spoke, and were perfectly willing to hear about Socrates, Michelangelo, Tchaikovsky, Hein, or even Marcus Aurelius, month by month, step by step, as I thought and read, I was able to follow Frankie further and further into this luminous world. The other distinguishing thing of Frankie was his devotion to art. He drew, he painted, as well as possible in a crowded tenement flat and often outdoors. And he visited museums. 
At an early age, I would, without anyone's consent, go with him to Metropolitan Museum of Art. We went and sometimes returned without spending the nickel fare. The trick was as follows. Several miles from where we lived was a junction point between the elevated train and the subway. People wishing to switch from one to the other were issued transfers. Often people took transfer slips without intending to change trains. They would drop the slips on the stairs or in the street. We would pick them up, ride down to 86th Street and Lexington Avenue and visit the museum. With awe and reverence, we climbed the long flight to the second floor, our eyes on Raphael's Madonna altarpiece as it came into view above, inch by inch. Then we stood before it. Religious? Yes. But an easygoing, undemanding religion. Innocent? Yes. But the innocence was of a very pretty girl of this world. Color? It caressed the eye and murmured of pleasures of the soul. More secular and more exciting to look at was a large Veronese on the wall facing Raphael. It was a Mars and Venus. On the lap of the muscular bearded god sat a very naked Venus looking down at an impish winged little Cupid squirting a jet of milk at him from her pink nipple. <laughs> hour after hour we wandered through the galleries adoring, studying, envying. Frankie's tastes were much more cultivated than mine. I admired the showy, Bonheur, that giant painting with the horses at the horse fair. Um, Tiepolo, Caravaggio, the Slick, David, Angra, the Campy, the Storm. I just put the Storm in a lecture I'm giving, uh, that very painting. Pygmalion and Galata. Frankie taught me to look at Rembrandt's painting of light and the miracle of his brushstrokes at Monet's shimmering Rouen Cathedral at Van Eyck's sound and simple structure under the meticulous detail. How often we went, I don't remember. But from then on, I could tell you what painting hung on almost every wall of every gallery. Once when my father was quite old, I said, why don't you go to the Met and walk around? I, you know, I'll drive you there. This, in the, since the renovation is a garage right in the building. He said, no, I don't need to go. He says, I can, to this day, close my eyes, see whole walls of painting, and see as though standing before it, every painting on the wall, every detail. It gets really teed off when the lace on the, um, on the um, uh, El Greco start to fade due to you know, pollution in the air. <laughs> so I'm gonna mount a class action suit against them. <laughs> How did we get home? I might volunteer to tell a policeman we had lost our money. <laughs> Sometimes we hitch rides uptown, would walk miles from where we were dropped off. Remember once we hopped on the rear of a horse-drawn ice wagon and rode from about 100th Street across the Willis Avenue Bridge into the Bronx. So Frankie's a sad story of uh, someone who you know wants to be an artist and ends up an upholsterer. And so it's very good and very moving at um, um, describing the outcomes of some of the lives of some of his friends. Really great portraits. Nietzsche and fruit. Almost as soon as I was old enough to get there by myself, I would walk the goodly number of blocks between Fox Street and the Woodstock branch of the public library. Set in a noisy, littered, crowded Market Street, it was a dignified structure of heavy granite blocks. Already, Carnegie libraries were, were all over. It had high, deep windows and iron door lamps, which sprouted tiers of long, graceful bent spikes. You left this world when you entered the place and stepped on the clean cork floor, ran your hand on the polished oak front desk, bathed in the quiet, the heavenly quiet, and smelled the books. You came with clean hands because the librarian insisted on inspecting them before you passed the front desk. Once in, I would wander before the shelves, pull out books at random, and bring them to a table. Animals of the Western world, how to build bird houses, a handbook of small arms. When I was working on this, I went and checked every title that he had, you know, because they're between A books and Amazon, they're all there. And he got them all right. <laughs> These were 
for the pictures. Progressively, my reading went from the fairy tales to Jack London, Maupassant, Poe and Shaw, and books on the body and mind. G. Stanley Hall's Adolescence, William James, the varieties, the varieties of religious experience, Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams. So let me just um, end with, there were, then he's got a whole section of his life in commerce, making jelly apples, being busted by the cops. You know, like, do you have a permit? <laughs> uh, you know, jelly donuts, the Sunday shoot. He had a BB gun and he could, um, you know, set up a dime and then, uh, I had this Daisy, Daisy BB rifle, which I did not earn by, well, I would put a bottle or can or card up on a projection of the hill stone and from the curb in front of our building aim at it. Someone would, was always watching. One Sunday, one of the men asked, um, no, Mr. Marksman, do you think you can hit a dime? I said, I try. I hit the dime. He put up. He let me have it. Other men came, became interested, and for a turn with a gun, each put a dime on a rock. Whoever hit the dime got it. Um, anyway, he made good money that way. <laughs> so let me end with this sort of um, oh, one more thing before I get to that. Um, so my father was and sort of a liberal for his day. He was in the New Deal. He wrote speeches for um, Roosevelt, Truman, Johnson, and Kennedy. But he wasn't, politics wasn't his thing. But he was you know, always just interested. And he describes, um, he's sitting on the curb eating a sandwich. Sat on the curb, my feet on the asphalt, and sipped from the small pail into which Mr. Marshall, the grocery store, had just ladled milk. In front of me on the asphalt was a torn piece of a newspaper. It was a piece of the editorial page of the world. On the scrap was part of a cartoon showing a small man reaching toward a basket of food hanging far above his head from a rope stretched over a pulley. Someone on the other side was pulling the rope. The small man had a tag attached to him, consumer. And uh, I read it as uh, consumer and thought it to be another word for customer. The basket rising above his reach was tagged cost of living. But the scrap was torn, so I couldn't tell who it was on the other side who was pulling <laughs> the basket of food away from him. And he still doesn't, you know, how oh boy. <laughs> Before I knew it, I emptied the pail. I never found out who the guilty one was on the other side. For many years, my interest in economics, history, law, and finance was spurred by my urge to find out, to no avail. <laughs> It's a great uh, story here about he discovers a crap game and uh, he's winning and his mother <laughs> finds out, comes, and of course all his, the money's been when he disappeared. So the book ends with this idea of uh, up and out. <clears throat> so he describes his family. So there's uh, the oldest brother, the next younger brother, it's my uncle Larry, and my father is very close to this brother, lived with him for many years. Um, the next younger brother had formed an ambition to be a doctor even before he came to this country at the age of nine. One of the odd jobs he did as a child in Chernovich was to collect bones for a woman who burned them to produce bone black. So of course in our age of, of uh, Wikipedia, you can look it up and oh, see. Black. Yeah, it's used as a, like a filter, to like a carbon filter to make pure water and stuff mm. like that. It also used, I think, as a pigment. Uh, he would wander through the streets picking up 
garbage for bones and carry them in a sack to the bone blacker. On his route, he passed the doctor's house, a low brick structure with casement windows. It had a neatly trimmed lawn strewn with gaily colored outdoor toys and was bordered by a high fence and dense sculptured privet. He would stop and look at the place and then shuffle away with his sack of bones. I know intimately what that house looked like, even though this passage in my brother's life preceded my birth. I know because the kid with the bone sack formed an ambition to become a doctor and build a house exactly like that one. He did both. This brother never had to be pressed to go to school except once after his graduation from Columbia College, where his tuition had been financed in part by the family, in part by loans and scholarships, and part by earnings from the operations of a dormitory laundry collection and delivery service. So really uh, industrious. During the summer following graduation, he operated a lucrative delivery route in Rockaway. There he met his wife-to-be, a school teacher, whose parents owned a Tudor-style summer house with a tennis court. Money and marriage were upmost in his mind. He neglected to apply to medical school for admission. When he told this to my mother, she slapped, you can just imagine. <laughs> she slapped her cheeks, rocked from side to side, and, and kneeled, moaned, and cried in grief. <laughs> That could not be matched if she had learned that he'd committed suicide. My son won't be a doctor. For the next few days, the life of all of us at home was a hell. My brother's expostulations were in vain. It was too late. They didn't, he said, it was too late. They don't take Jews anyway. He could make more money in the butter and eggs and delivery teacher business and marry a teacher. The moaning and wailing continued. A few days later, there occurred an event which, to this day, baffles and awes my brother and me. My mother, calm and serene, told my brother that she had had a dream. In it, my brother went to see the dean of the Columbia Medical School. She dreamed that the dean greeted my brother, asked him to sit down, and offered him a glass of wine. My brother asked whether it would be possible to enter the medical school in a late admission. The dean asked for his college record, and after looking through it, shook hands with my brother and told him he could enroll. My brother saw the dream as one of her tricks. <laughs> he was persuaded to yield to her insistence that he visit the dean. By her promise, which wasn't really worth two cents, that if he failed to be admitted, she would stop badgering him. He went. He came back stunned. It had happened just the way my mother had dreamed. The wine, the reading of the college record, the handshake, the admissions. My mother had often before claimed visionary and clairvoyant powers, and we had scoffed at her. Let me just go back before I finish up. Something I didn't read, but becomes interesting at this point. Nat's parents came from the town of Chernovich in the Carpathian Mountains and what had, uh, was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire and which has had several national masters since. His father came here first. The plan was that he would make some money, send it to his wife, and she would come with the children. He neglected to send the money. <laughs> he was having a great time. He would steal horses and go riding all night in the wilds of the Bronx. He neglected to send the money. So working as a spy for several factions in the region, his wife got the money on her own and came with the children. She was apparently somewhat of a Matahari. <laughs> so that's the one who had this clairvoyant vision. What led my parents, who lived a meager life, to make these sacrifices for their children? I think their motives differed somewhat. My father, I believe, wished his sons to be free from subjugations to a boss, and equally free of dependence on others in doing one's work and making one's way. Success in business of any kind would be difficult without either or both. The obvious way up and out was through a profession. 
My mother's motives were, I think, revealed by a small incident. She had once gone to the office of a utility company to pay a bill. She was starry-eyed when she came home. In Yiddish, she moaned, such a big place, filled with all those clean people with suits and ties and eyeglasses. <laughs> they sit at a desk. They write on paper. It was so light and quiet. Only the typewriter machines make such a nice sound. This was the paradise of security and orderliness and respectability. And these were what she wanted for her children. She knew of no way it could be gotten except through education. How different were these views from those associated with learning among the pious Jews in the ghettos of Europe? There, a young man who was a fool could earn great respect and be sought after as a son-in-law if he knew the Siddur prayer book by heart and was able to quote liberally from the Torah and able to stick a pin into a Talmud and know every word pierced by the pin in the pages that followed. <laughs> respect for such learning is a fool's respect for an idiot savant. There were wise men among the learned. The storehouse of Jewish folk tales is filled with instances of this wisdom. But is, it was this wisdom despite learning and not because of it. I have a nostalgia for lost aspects of Jewish life, but not for the pungent insularities of the ghettos, inc including learning. Mine is for the Fox Street, now gone, burned out, lying in rubble, where a kid could once yell up, Ma, faf me un butter stickle and butter pitter. Ma, throw me down a little piece of bread and butter. Uh -huh. <laughs> He was something special because you might have taken him for granted until you were <clears throat> 10 years ago or was it 20 years ago when did you start to think about it? this this is he was uh well you know it's such a wonderful life and i'll ask my sister to comment as well <laughs> but um you know, my memories really come into focus. I mean, I have a little bit of memories before that, but my father was in the Security and Exchange Commission. They got moved out of Washington during the war to make room for all the war stuff, which even filled the mall with Quonset huts. There was so much um, uh, bureaucracy moving in there. So we were in Philadelphia and in Paoli, which is like on the main line, beautiful farm area. It was, we were surrounded by real farms and uh, uh, and so I didn't know that many other kids. I didn't know that I was any different. And, and, uh, but you know, my father always had an easel in the attic and was painting. But then when we got to Great Neck, around fourth grade, um, he, you know, the basement, had, we had a kiln and a potter's wheel. And he was making sculpture and, and painting. And uh, eventually he got a huge etching press, you know, so you could scrape copper and then put it through there and make uh, prints. And so there was just always this activity. And so I'd go to other friends' houses and there would be intelligent people, you know, always, you always look at the books, you know. <laughs> you know, like, like the, um, the rich people didn't read, just had all these leather-bound books, you know. <laughs> and then I remember uh, there was a guy who was a lawyer at a prominent firm, but he had modern library, and you could tell they read those books you know, of all those of all the classics. So, but the fact that there was all this art going on and this informality, he didn't care how he dressed. Uh, uh, you know, he was always just very comfortable. The house was comfortable. Kids came over, friends came over, and had a good time. So I guess it became apparent when I was already in fourth and fifth grade and friends would start coming over. And then later, they, it was just everybody would hang out there, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, had uh, musician friends and the drum set was just permanently there because <laughs> it was too much to carry around and dismantle. And um, they would hang out. And so I, you know, it, it was just, it was, uh, I mean, we all love our parents, but uh, um, that, was, that was a great experience. So what I appreciate about my family, and I appreciate it from the government people, is that they 
that we always had art and we always had um, discussions. And even myself being young, they would have, be having an adult discussion about politics and they would listen to me, you know, and I was respected. I know that other people who get into the arts were like isolated and they had, they discovered the library and they had to, you know. Discovered on their own. Discovered on their own. So we had that. And I think a lot of Jewish people did have that because the parents valued it. Yeah, the, uh, and it, it's interesting how they had pretty good art books, but they were, they didn't have color reproductions in the 50s. You know, and when they did have color, it was really poor quality. It's literally not till the 60s when they have something called continuous offset. The way you would make pink would be red dots with white in between. And you could see the dots. You know, but the idea of really rich color reproductions is the late 60s uh, when that finally happened. So we had art books, but as good as you could have in those days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't read these beautiful passages that you were, uh, gave us the experience of, but I did read the preface that you wrote about your father. And in there, you happened to talk about his artistic technique. And you were talking specifically about him sculpting and the way he would then sort of begin to layer uh, little pieces of uh, clay on and, and, or build it up. And then you said he did the same thing with painting. And what I noticed as you were reading was it was exactly that technique. Because every single chapter that you seem to give us started with an empty arena of somebody coming. And then all of a sudden you began to watch different pieces begin to fit in and flow and build <clears> up. And all of a sudden, we were surrounded by a total, what, what the Iceman was about, what somebody else was about. But it, it started so, so, you know, like empty. And then all of a sudden, it's one piece after another, and you're visualizing every little piece as if he had artistically done the prose. It, it, it's an amazing thing. He's a better writer than I realized. <laughs> he, he was a total, um, total natural comfort with language. So uh, he had studied French in high school, so it was fluid in French. He just picked up German from, from Yiddish. He totally handled Latin, because if you know French, you, you, know, you know Latin. Um, yeah, he's just completely facile in language. And um, uh, his, my, he, he was very close to Griselda's, my sister's daughter. And, they had this incredible correspondence. He makes up these huge stories that go on and on in their letters. You know, she goes off to school, he writes this stuff for her. So I don't know if that's ever published, but there's just mountains of this brilliant writing and, and this real sense of humor. But I was yeah, always amazed that, that he, like, there's a marble sculpture of a woman just sort of sitting like this. You know, so it's very blocky. And that's the only marble piece. Then there's a wood sculpture of a torso. That's the only wood piece. Then, and you know, but absolutely perfect. You know, he had somehow picked all this up. He had studied at the Art Students League and, and these other schools as a kid. Um, he wanted to be an artist and then, um, He, shoved, oh, he, he ran away from home to be an artist. So he got a, a basement apartment in the village in exchange for shoveling the coal. Because in those days, your heat came from the coal. So somebody had to shovel the coal in the furnace regularly. Uh, otherwise, you didn't have heat. So he shoveled coal in exchange for a basement apartment in New York's Greenwich Village and studied at the Beaux-Arts Institute, the Leonardo da Vinci School of Art, and the Art Students League, among other places. He was discouraged when told that the entrance to the Sculptors Union, which would have assured public commissions, cost $50, an impossible amount. He had a perpetual cold while living in the chilly apartment, and when his brother Larry hunted him down and told him, Ma says you can come home if you go back to high school, he accepted the offer. <laughs> but he, um, 
the last couple of years of high school and then all through City College, he lived with his brother who had already established his medical practice. So he was <coughs> medically, you know, he, he knew cadaver anatomy, knew what was inside the body. He, uh, he had helped his brother in surgery. You know, some kid fell off, so something ripped his leg open with a, on a spike fence and he worked for hours with his brother, you know, cleaning it, sewing it up, putting the muscles together. Uh, so it was just, it just <laughs> this guy knew everything. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce lived down the street from us in Great Neck. So I met, I met Nat probably around 1951 or so when he moved to Great Neck. And um, just by the way, he was known by everybody as an intellect, and he was known as an artist, and mostly a very nice person. Really, really was. And in the whole time, he's a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Who would think that a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of talk about the disappearance of industry in New York City. In the time of your father lived in the, in the South Bronx, was it primarily an industrial environment? Like, were the smells and sounds of his daily wor world? Is it, you refer to a few things there. But was it an industrial? Yeah, he just, I think, and even in the part I read, there were, he's right near a piano factory, and there's right. metal working and smelting, and, and then there's a really great passage. He describes how they made gas from coal. And it's this giant yeah. furnaces, and the glow comes out. Certainly, the air was very polluted. The, the he's, he, 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 pretty bright description of what was in the water in the East River. Uh, they didn't have sewage treatment in those days. Uh, so yeah, it was it was it was uh, industrial. And uh, this is a, just a weird, random question, but why you mentioned that Jews almost universally boil their meat? Why? I mean, it's it's not a preferred taste because boiling meat robs it of its. I don't know. I, sure, I think it's because they had no idea how to cook. Was it a sanitary thing? Or oh. Uh, also, if you're, if you're, I'm going to make a guess. If you're Italian, you, you might be living, you know, on a farm or whatever, whatever. And so you could roast outdoors. You don't want to have live coals in a tenement apartment. And Jews always live, they're not farmers. They always live in crowded tenement areas in the ghettos of Europe and in mm -hmm. the lower. So you wouldn't want to be grilling meat in an open fire in the Lower East Side here. Right. So it probably just starts from that. And as Bruce said, that, that there's, this is not a great cuisine. So you throw it in there, it's cooked, and you're okay. <laughs> Theo. Uh, Theo's a colleague of mine from Pratt Institute. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I feel through you, because I've known you for 45 years, by the way, okay? <laughs> um, because um, in my opinion, you know, you're your father. I mean, you're like your father. Yeah. Very much so. Well, I'm flattered. And, but... <laughs> well, I mean, just that, uh, well, and, uh, don't be too flattered, but no, because of your, yeah, because of, you know, just because of these incredibly diverse interests that you yourself have, and you fortunately shared with a lot of us, you know, which I appreciate. So my question to you is, towards the end of his life, who and what do you think your father wanted to be? Um, he once said something interesting. He was counsel for a House subcommittee on monopolies. But, well, backing up, one of his teachers at Columbia was Adolf Burley. And Adolf Burley was the architect of the Roosevelt Brain Trust. He put together the people to, you know, make this modern Roosevelt world. And he picked my father to be part of that, and he, he went to the Security and Exchange Commission. After <coughs> Kennedy, he didn't meet Kennedy Sr., who was the first commissioner, but right after that. And he very quickly rose to run the place. Uh, he was executive advisor to the commissioner. And at one point he said, I was extremely powerful because I was totally without fear, because I was totally without ambition. <laughs> and he wasn't. He was, you know, he 
there wasn't anything he wanted to do that uh, you know, burning, driving desire. He, when we, uh, he, he was first at the SEC, I was in first grade, and we were in this big old uh, one room schoolhouse, huge, rustic, beautiful building on it, two acres of land in Paoli, just about three or four minutes from the train station, which, you know, on the main line. But, and there was so, there was some main line stuff like the schools and et cetera, but the farms surrounding it. And my father was always going to the junkyard buying frames and, you know, you get old frames and frame paintings and, and he wanted to be an artist. And my mother said, let's do it, you know, give up your job, we'll, own a, we'll open an art supply store, and you can be a painter. And my father thought about it and said, I don't want to take the risk. So the fact that he wasn't a painter, he could have been, but he had no desire, you know, to be a painter, have a gallery, you know, be in the art world. Um, he just painted for himself. So what do you think drove him? Curiosity. Yeah, just this, this, it's something I think I feel. I'm not that ambitious and, you know, but there's just this tableau in front of us of ideas, of art, of, my wife gets bugged with how I have to go to the museum and every time we go somewhere, I gotta go, I just, and I'm not, you know, I just look at it my own way. I, I, t- I tend to just zip through the galleries. I don't, you know, I have my own way of looking at them, but um, I'm at the moment fascinated by the stuff going on in technology. You know, I follow Ray Kurzweil's newsletter. My father subscribed to Scientific American in the 1950s, and I remember uh, some of the, there's uh, something going on right now, self-replicating machines. Well, the first article about that is about von Neumann, and you slide these puzzle pieces down a chute, and they'll they'll link together. So that's it made itself, and that was an article that I read in the 50s in the Scientific American, and talked to him about it. At the time, the debate was between digital computers and analog computers, and which were going to be superior. And um, uh, so he had that curiosity, and I. Seems natural to me because that's the way I see things. <laughs> yeah. Hi. This is a relative of my mother. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Larry, and uh, many times we went to visit your father, and I feel very fortunate that I did know him. To me, he was always an artist. I mean, I was too young to even know that he had that past. That he had to make a living? Yes, I didn't even know that. But just to say that when you were reading that passage about uh, uh, your mother having this, uh, I don't remember your grandma, having, uh, well, the whole, the whole story about going into the admissions in school and all that. All right. You were reading that, it seemed you were almost channeling that, actually. I mean, you were reading it for a moment. That was him reading it. It was, it was incredible. Thank you. I don't think of you as being your father, but in that, there were some moments that, they were like that. Oh, also, I, the thing yeah. about the stories, you said he, uh, that he wrote a lot of stories to uh, Michelle. And I do remember going to the, the house, uh, there was a lot of, there was a group of kids that were quite uh, younger. And we would, I remember one time going into a room, all the kids, the kids were in the room with <coughs> your father. And we would just shout out, oh, we would just shout out, oh, oh, But the patient survived. Anyway, just for stories, I just remember as kids, we would just shout out anything, and then your father would make up and tell us a story about that, whatever it was. I remember saying, uh, tell us a story about the monkey who fell through the chair, because And he tells a story about a monkey who fell through the chair. So it was great. Yeah, uh, well, and, and then he was a musician. He always, yeah. uh, there's uh, all these stories in here how he came to play the violin. And then there were always string quartets in the house when I was a kid. 
and then Texaco's uh, opera on Saturday, Sundays, they broadcast live in Metropolitan Opera. And so the certain summer days, I'll, you know, when the air wafts through the apartment, I'll recall those, you know, the Texaco um, uh, Metropolitan broadcasts. I'll tell you a, a couple other stories. One is, um, so my mother's father, so my mother was Holzinger, German family. Her father had a bad heart from rheumatic, rheumatic fever as a kid. So his wife worked uh, at Saks Fifth Avenue. She ran the jewelry, she created and ran the jewelry repair desk. He stayed home and wrote mysteries. And so my mother grew up in that milieu. So my parents are married, they're lying in bed, you know, in the summer, no sheets, windows open, no air conditioning. My mother says to my father, how would you commit the perfect murder? So my father says, as so. My mother says, now if you were the detective, how would you solve it? And so my father says, as so. My mother says, we gotta write a novel. <laughs> so um, he would, she would dictate, he would type, uh, she would type, he would dictate, they you know, go back and forth and working on this for maybe about a year. And at one point, this dictation thing, uh, right after the war, Sears Roebuck sold, this is before tape recorders, a wire recorder. So the spool had metallic wire. And my father was always with a, a flashlight and a tweezer. The wire would get caught in a spindle and go... <laughs> <laughs> and I had to send it back to Sears. The thing never worked. But anyway, um, so they wrote this book. They put it in a shoebox and sent it to Harper's and said, we have written a novel in English. <laughs> and if they hadn't accepted it, they might not have done anything else with it. But it did get published by Harper's, which is now Harper and Row and Harper, etc. And a major Hollywood producer was going to make a musical, and they were all in negotiations, and then he died of a heart attack. Oh. Uh, and then they wrote another novel, and their editor said, no, it's really two books. You've got to rewrite it as two books. And they said, no, we don't, no, we don't bother. Uh, they didn't have, feel a need to be writers, so they didn't, um, they didn't pursue it. So another... Um, <coughs> You can all come back in a couple of years and have my mother's book done. <laughs> um, it's taken me longer because it's got a lot of illustrations and photos and I've got to, you know. John, you should mention that the books are out and they can be Yeah, there are books out there and you, I can I have my father's autograph and a rubber stamp. Uh, but, so my, my mother did I think my father was smart. My mother did high school in three years. She did Barnard in three years, and she was the first woman to go to Columbia Law School. So, a uh, really great story. She, one of her Barnard classmates, women were not allowed to go to Columbia Law School, and one of her Barnard classmates is looking through Columbia's charter and sees anybody in a college at Columbia can go to any graduate school. Well, they're Barnard's part of Columbia, so they said, we're going, and, they said, and the administrator said, well, I guess you can. So five of them go, and they're all sitting in the back row in torts, which is a really nasty course. And if you've ever seen the movie or the TV show, The Paper Chase, uh, in which this bombastic teacher, your minds are full of mush, and I'm going to teach you to think logically like a lady. This guy is really coming on like that. And these women are sitting there. One of my sisters, my, my mother's friends, in the middle of class, gets up, walks out, walks across the street, goes back to Barnard. <laughs> I'm not putting up with this. Another one, after class, goes to his office and says, I'm not coming to any more of your classes. I'm going to pass the exam, and you will marry me. <laughs> <laughs> Three years later, he was divorced and married her. <laughs> and she was the only one left alive when, finally, years later, Columbia realized they had this phenomenon, and they sent an anthropology student to do, um, when they record oral history with my mother. About all. So she recalled all this. Yeah. Well, no. It, it was 
maybe 15 years before she died. And then around that time, Columbia wanted her to come to a reunion. And she was, she was in a wheelchair and all that. She said, we'll send whatever's needed. You know, we, we can send a, uh, a vehicle that can get you there. And I said, well, who's going to be there? Well, this woman who was the only other one left alive was this one. And she said, I never liked her. So I'm like, <laughs> but then, so, so, my, so my mother's walking up these stairs in the law school. And my father sees her and says, Great leg. Somebody introduced me to that woman. So he was kind of aggressive that way. You know, he, he, was, he was a real card. And so they go out to lunch, and the first thing he says is, will you marry me? So she thinks real fast. She says, if I say no, he'll say, what are you, afraid? If I say yes, I don't have to marry him. So she says, yes. <laughs> totally short-circuited. He didn't bring it up again you know, for a couple of years. So finally, they're dating. And he falls in love with uh, her parents, particularly her father. And they play chess together. And uh, he's quite an intellect himself. Um, and not, I'll take that back. He wasn't intellectual. He was, you know, well-educated. But he was anti-intellectual. So she's, they're going to their first party. You know, all of my father's intellectual friends and law school friends. And John Holzinger, my grandfather, says to his daughter, my mother, you wait and see. Within 15 minutes, they're going to have killed somebody. So my mother comes, and she sits on the sofa, and she looks at her watch. Seven minutes later. If you were in the Louvre Museum, and there was a fire, and you could only rescue a person who fainted or the Mona Lisa, which would you rescue? <laughs> well, seven minutes. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, both of them wrote about their childhood. They didn't write, you know, they should have written about their whole lives because it was uh, it was quite something. So anything else anybody wants to ask? So thank you everybody thank for you. coming. This is fantastic. It's a great turnout. If anybody wants books are out there, just drop off ten dollars in the cup and if anybody wants an autograph, I'll pick up a rubber stamp. <laughs> Socialists or you know, communists, communists, communists.